Good afternoon and welcome to the Scottish Parliament and to, and to our Festival of Politics. I'm Trisha Marwick, MSP and as presiding officer, I am delighted to be your host for the inaugural Campbell Christie Lecture. Scotland's Futures Forum was created by the Scottish Parliament to help our members, along with the wider community in Scotland, look beyond the immediate horizons to the challenges and the opportunities of the future. This memorial lecture has been sponsored by the Forum to recognise a founding director of the Forum and one of Scotland's most outstanding civic leaders. I would particularly like to welcome Campbell's wife, Betty, and family members to the Chamber Gallery. I am delighted that they could join us here in the Scottish Parliament today. A very warm welcome also to the Right Honourable Gordon Brown MP and to all of Campbell's former colleagues and friends from the STUC and beyond for joining us today. Campbell's contribution extended into all sectors of Scottish life, including trade unionism, politics, football, economic regeneration, and community development. In recognition of his many achievements, he was awarded a CBA in 1997. On retiro from the STUC, he didn't rest on his laurels, but continued to serve the public in many different ways and capacities. Campbell was a key figure in the campaign for a Scottish Parliament, and few of us would be sitting here today if it had not been for the efforts of Campbell Christie. He latterly chaired the Scottish Government's Commission on the Future Delivery of Public Services, which reported in June last year, as well as having several spells as chairman of his beloved Falkirk Football Club. Campbell served for seven years with enthusiasm and commitment as a forum director, that enthusiasm and commitment in everything that he did. I am very pleased, therefore, and it is fitting uh, that the inaugural Campbell Christie Lecture will be delivered by the former Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Gordon Brown MP. Can I, thank you very much. Can, can, I, can I say, first of all, what a, a real privilege it is to be here uh, to speak for the first time in this Scottish Parliament building uh, and to be giving the in inaugural Campbell Christie Memorial Lecture. Uh, and I want to pay tribute, too, to Campbell's widow, Betty, uh, to his brother, Leslie, his sister-in-law, Jean, his son, uh, who is Doug, who is here with us uh, today. Uh, I want to pay tribute to the STUC and all the trade union friends of Campbell who are here today for what they have achieved and to the Scottish Futures Forum. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be able to speak to such a large audience. I may say the first time I ever spoke in Edinburgh many, many years ago, I went along to speak to a meeting for the Workers' Educational Association, and it was one of these uh, conferences that they'd organised, and I was to do the first hour slot of speaking. I arrived there and found that my audience was in total two people. One of them was supposed to be chairman, and he said he had a far more important thing to do, uh, and could he please uh, be excused? And when I asked the other person why he was there, he said he was the next speaker. <laughs> I want to start with a story about Campbell's life, which will illustrate what I want to say this afternoon. At 17, Campbell left home, left uh, from Scotland to go to Woolwich in London to take up a job as a civil servant. And as he left home, his mother gave him three envelopes. The first envelope was the money for his digs, his accommodation and his food. The second envelope was what his mother was giving him for his fares, his rail fares, and then his bus fares when he got to London. And the third em envelope was his trade union subscription. And his mother recognized that with a husband who had died of an industrial disease without sick pay, without a pension, without a death benefit, that Campbell needed the protection of uh, trade union behind him. And she realized, although, as Campbell says, she wasn't uh, a political figure, that what we needed to fight for and achieve was social justice. Uh, and I want to make the theme of my remarks this afternoon, social justice and what is the best way of achieving it, uh, social justice and what we mean by it in Scotland, social justice and whether the roots to it lie through an independent country or through a Scottish parliament and being part of the United Kingdom. 
and I hope that I will be able in the ideas that I put forward this afternoon to stimulate a debate about the principles that underlie this debate about Scotland's future and not just the process, the procedures uh, about how we get to a referendum vote. Now Campbell, the last time I met Campbell was actually, and Betty was there as well, uh, at a football match at uh, Wraith Rovers versus Falkirk and I was pretty honest with them then that while I had been a lifelong supporter of uh, Wraith Rovers and he had been a lifelong supporter of Falkirk, he had achieved more than I had been able to achieve. He'd managed to get them as chairman of the Falkirk Football Club, a 12 million pound stadium uh, paid for by the local council in part. And he'd also got them six years in the Premier League. And I had achieved absolutely nothing of that regard, even although we claimed that Wraith Rovers was about to become the third force in Scottish football. <laughs> Campbell might have been a goalkeeper, you know that he was a great negotiator. And I think Campbell was part of this great tradition of Scottish negotiators, trade union leaders, uh, who you would turn to if you wanted to solve a problem. And of course, in the case of Falkirk, he was appointed by the Court of Session to be the chairman of Falkirk to get them out of the difficulties. Uh, and I would compare him to trade unionists that I've known in my life, including some of the great internationalist trade unions. I remember Lula, the president of Brazil, telling me what he did when he was trying to negotiate as a trade union leader. He, he said, when I was a young shop steward and things needed changed, I blamed the government. He said, when I became a trade union organizer full time and things were wrong and needed changed, I blamed the government. He said, when I became the leader of the opposition party in Brazil and things were wrong and needed changed, I blamed the government. And then when I became the government, he said, I blamed America. <laughs> Campbell, Campbell, Campbell was not only a great negotiator, he was also, of course, much involved in the politics of Scotland, as Tricia has just explained uh, uh, to you. And I remember it was one of Campbell's friends, I'll not name him because you might blame him, who got me into politics in the first place. Uh, and one of his friends came to me and said, uh, they wanted me to stand, this is when I was a student, uh, they wanted me to stand for the Edinburgh Council and I said to him, look, I don't know much about rate support grants and council affairs. I don't know if I'm the best person uh, to be on the council at this time. And the guy said to me, as a trade union leader would say to you, look, son, if we were going to win the seat, you wouldn't be the candidate. <laughs> now, Campbell, as you know, is to be remembered for what he achieved in helping us get a Scottish Parliament but he's also got to be remembered for what his ultimate beliefs were, and that his, was his belief in social justice. And when I talked about Donald Dewar two weeks ago at the Edinburgh Book Festival, I said that I thought there were two great Scottish ideas that we should uh, not only hold fast to, but remember how much they've influenced everything we've done. The first idea is about the dignity of the individual and how that is to be achieved by removing the constraints that prevented the potential of an individual being realized. And that was particularly true because Scotland led the way in education for every child. And the second was the belief from the Scottish Enlightenment that there was a moral core to the public realm. And I believe that these two very big important ideas are really encapsulated in what Campbell not only believed but did. That his passionate belief was and the dignity of the individual was realized, and the core that is moral at the center of the public realm is achieved by the strength with which we pursue the case for social justice. And I believe that that idea, the strength with which we pursue the case for social justice, is not only an important idea in Scotland, it is probably the defining idea of Scotland. And you can go right through Scottish history, you can start in pre-Catholic Reformation Scotland, you can start with the Solemn League and Covenant in the uh, Reformation period. You can go to the poetry of Burns or you can go to the writings of Adam Smith. You can come right through to the 20th century and you see that the most passionate view that is held by most of these writers, including people that we don't normally associate with left-wing politics, is their passionate commitment to social justice. I'll give you one example, the Clydesiders, elected to Parliament in 1922, James Max and John Wheatley, Tom Johnson, all these great uh, MPs who went to Westminster. When they were elected, they issued a solemn declaration. They issued it in 1922, just after they'd been elected and were on the way uh, to take the cause of poverty and slums into Parliament and to become the children's champions of the country. 
And Maxon, of course, who ended up being suspended from Parliament because he was accused, accused the Tories of being murderers of children. And they issued this declaration on the day they left for Westminster. And if you read this declaration and how they phrased it, it was that they were standing there in the great traditions of Scottish social justice. They would bear in their hearts the sorrows of the poor and the aged and the widow, that they shall not be without comfort. They would have regard to those who had fallen in the struggle for life. They would urge without ceasing the need for housing. And then they went on to say that they were the honored inheritors of the tradition of a Scotland that believed in social justice. And that was what made them take. They were people who were trying to do what they thought generations of Scots had tried to do, was pursue uh, the cause of freedom and justice for people within Scotland. And then go right through to the 1980s and to the rebellion against the Thatcherite policies in Scotland. And I could give you many examples of speeches and of things that were said then and of writings and of statements. And of course, you go to the claim of right, you then go to Donald Dewar's first speech in this parliament as he launched and inaugurated the Scottish parliament. But I take one example, and that is William McIlvenny's writings. If you look at a book called Surviving the Shipwreck, Willie McIlvenny, who is a, a friend of mine, wrote in the 1980s, published in the early 90s, what he believed was the great Scottish tradition of social justice. And he actually put it this way, uh, that people in Scotland, they had a dream, he said. And it was not the dream, even for people who were poor, who could have been accused of having a dream of comfort, of possessions, of money, of status, of power. Their dream, he said, included everyone. Their dream was different from what you might expect an ordinary dream to be. They had a dream that you could build an economy that served the people rather than the people serving the economy. They believed that injustices should not happen to them, but they should also not happen to anyone. They believed that people should be judged by, not by their possessions or their status, but by their qualities as individuals. And they believed that they were part of this great inheritance of a belief in social justice that came across the centuries, something that influenced everything that we do. And then come through to 2011 and Campbell's own report on the public commission that he set up, uh, where it, it, he chaired, that was set up by the government here on public services. And what was the basis of that report? He could have been excused for writing just about the management of public services or the delivery of public services or the efficiency of public services, but he said, rightly so, that public services existed so that they could further and advance the cause of social justice, that what was wrong in Scotland was that there were inequalities that had to be addressed. What was wrong was the deprivation and the low aspirations that were because public services had not prevented uh, some of the evils that now disfigured Scottish society. And so the whole ethos of that report which was not a managerial approach to public services, although he demanded efficiency and value for money. And I know councils across the country are implementing this report because they believe it will achieve value for money and that is right to achieve. He believed that underlying the commitment to good public services was a commitment to social justice. And I would say, out of Scottish history, there are three things that I think we should remember. First of all, the idea of social justice defines Scotland. As McIlvany says in his book, he says he was in Paris and he met someone and he said, you Scots, he said, this Parisian, are all the same. Always the moral argument. Always the insistent case for justice. Always demanding that things change. And when someone said, what is the difference between Jenny Lee, who was a Scot, and an Iron Bevan, a Welshman, who was her husband, said the difference was that Jenny Lee kept coming back to what are the principles that underlie social justice. And I think the second thing that comes out of Scottish writings and Scottish thinkers that we've got to remember when we have this debate is not only that it defines our view of Scotland, that we want a socially just Scotland, but that thought and action have got to go together. All these thinkers, they never believed it was enough to have an abstract argument about what was social justice. What they wanted to do was to ensure that we actually acted to achieve social justice. And in Scottish thinking, thought and emotion and action all go together. You cannot have one without the other. And the third thing, and this is, I think, incredibly important to what I'm about to say about what I see as the implications of this. They thought that justice, all these thinkers, was not just something for Scotland, it was a universal idea. They were talking about something that they believed was appropriate 
to human nature in every circumstance. They were writing about something that didn't just have a Scottish application, but had an international application as well. They believed that their ideas of justice were relevant, not just to one generation, but to every generation. Their ideas of justice were not just relevant to one territory or to one ethnic group, but were relevant to everyone. And that's why we think of people in Scotland as internationalists, not because we have lots of emigrants, em, uh, people who have emigrated, not just because we've got a sentimental attachment to lots of different continents in the world where there are Scots, but because we believed as internationalists that the ideas that we were pursuing, that there should be justice, there should be justice not just in Scotland, but justice ev everywhere. And when we opposed the Thatcher policies in the 1980s, and this comes back to what McIlvany was writing about, we didn't oppose them just because the injured Scottish sentiment. We didn't oppose them just because they tried to change unfairly Scottish conditions and impose the poll tax. We opposed them because they thought, we thought they offended basic values about how human beings should live their lives, basic values about how communities should organize themselves, basic values that we thought and agreed had universal application. And of course, that was the whole point of the Scottish Enlightenment. We were not just talking about human nature as it was in our individual communities. We were talking about what we thought were the principles that governed human behavior in all situations. So social justice, in my view, the coming together of two big ideas about uh, what human nature is and what a community is in Scotland defines our country, means that we are impelled to act on principles of social justice, but also we believe that these have application, not just in our own communities, in our own country, but across the world. And when you think of it, in the last two centuries in particular, action for social justice in local communities, in the Scottish office and now in the Scottish Parliament, with its agenda to tackle poverty and deprivation, internationally action for social justice from the missionaries of the different churches, to the international engagement of so many people. And indeed, one young person was telling me the other day that when, they, when he wrote to Campbell Christie and asked him, because he was doing a project in Nicaragua and found out that Campbell had been in Nicaragua, Campbell immediately said to this young boy who he'd never met, come and I'll give you some of my papers and talk to you about Nicaragua. The interest that we all have in what is happening in so many countries that are not our own country, but countries all around the world. And what does it mean then? It means that we have to act on our principles of social justice locally, nationally, and internationally. It means that the stage on which we have to operate as Scots is not simply in our own country, but across the world. And it means in practice that in the last two centuries, if you look at the history of the trade union movement, the trade union movement in Scotland saw its role not simply as building better conditions in Scotland, but building better conditions in Britain and better conditions beyond it. We sometimes forget that the organizer of the first trade union in the 1790s, the London Corresponding Society, was a Scot who'd come down from Stirlingshire. We sometimes forget that the organizer of the National Union of Mine Workers, when it was formed in the 1860s in England, was a Scot who'd already tried Alexander MacDonald to form a Lanarkshire Miners' Union and a Scottish Miners' Union. We cannot forget, of course, that the organizer of the British Labour Party was Keir Hardy, who started off forming a Scottish Labour Party and thought that he was right to form a British Labour Party. And Campbell Christie, of course, was accused of being part of what was called the Socky Hall Street Mafia, a group of Scottish trade union leaders who people accused of running the British trade union movement. But you think of any major trade union in the last 50 years, and in each one of them, whether it's uh, an agriculture union, or whether it's a mining union, whether it's an industrial union, whether it's engineers, or whether it's unskilled workers, in all these unions, in most generations, one of the major leaders is someone who comes from Scotland. And the reason is this. Why did we decide that while we had a Scottish poor law in the 17th century, in the 18th century, in the 19th century, that we actually needed to have British legislation for social policy? Why did we not decide that we would try and get laws formulated simply in Scotland to deal with these issues? And I would say there were three reasons, and they're all relevant to today. One is that we believe that social justice was an international and not just national imperative. Secondly, we believed that if you pooled and shared resources across a wider area, 
you could do better by the people you were trying to protect. So if you pooled and shared the insurance and you pooled and shared the risk, you could do better for the people you were representing. And thirdly, you didn't want to create a situation where dog eats dog, where people are fighting each other in a race to the bottom, and therefore you wanted unity amongst working people right across the United Kingdom. And so, social insurance. Why did we not have social insurance simply in Scotland and in England and in Wales and Northern Ireland, but demanded that we have national insurance right across the whole of the United Kingdom? Because we knew that by pulling the resources to fight sickness and ill health and disability and unemployment, we could get people a better deal. Why did we decide in 1908 that the first old age pension, when the poor law for pensioners was administered in Scotland, was at a UK level? Because we thought we could get a better deal for pensioners in that way. Then take unemployment and what we had to do in the 1920s and 1930s to deal with unemployment. It was a rebellion in Fife that started the end of the poor law as we know it. Because people refused in Fife to allow unemployed people to go without benefits. But of course the result of that was that no local poor law authority could afford to pay the unemployment benefit and therefore the demand came from Fife and then from Scotland that this had to be a national charge, a British charge that had to be paid by a British government and that there was insufficient resources at that time in Scotland to enable people to pay unemployment benefit. And then take the National Health Service. Why is it that the rules of the National Health Service administered in Scotland, like sickness benefit used to be but not is now, why is it that the rules of the National Health Service were to pool and share resources across the whole of the United Kingdom so that everybody had an equal right to health care, whichever part of the country they lived in, and the health service was financed not by local or Scottish or Welsh or English taxes, but by taxes and national insurance at a UK level. Well, Tom Johnson in the 1940s paved the way for what Aniron Bevan did in creating the health service in 1948. Because Johnson said that the proposal of the coalition government of the 1940s, similar to what had come out of the Beveridge Report on Welfare, was unacceptable. Because what was originally pro proposed to create a national health service was that local authorities would run the healthcare system. And local authorities would take over the hospitals, and local authorities would employ or give fees to the general practitioners. And Tom Johnson said, as Scottish Secretary at that time, that this was completely unacceptable because no local authority was going to be able to afford it on their own. There had to be a national system. There had to be nationalization of the healthcare system. And the only way forward was to pool the resources across the whole of the United Kingdom so that everybody could benefit from national insurance paid by all. And so the needs of all were to be met by fair taxation of those people who could afford it. And hence, the National Health Service where we stopped a proposal in the 1940s that would not have given us a nationalized health service to get to the better proposal in 1948. Now, of course, it wasn't always welcomed in Scotland that you had this nationalized health service. Uh, I'm told that in Glasgow, on the day the health service was formed, the red flag was put up outside the Glasgow hospital by students. But in Edinburgh, they actually held a service, a memorial service, to mark the end of voluntary and charitable hospitals so it wasn't wholly welcomed by everyone, but I think anybody who's sitting here today knows that the benefits that come from the pooling and sharing of resources within the National Health Service have generally been to the benefit of people. And the principle is one that most countries, indeed, if they do not apply it, do so at their peril in the rest of the world. And then take housing. John Wheatley was the housing minister. He recognized that there was no way that a local authority or a Scottish office uh, or uh, any organization that was local was going to be able to afford to build houses, the millions of houses that were needed for people who couldn't afford to pay to buy the houses and had to be asked to pay rents that they could afford. And so they demanded a massive exchequer subsidy for that to happen, and the only way that that could be done was to be done at a British level. And so we've got to recognize when we enter this debate about social justice, and about the future of social justice. Just what the history of social policy is in Scotland. Were these guys, the trade union leaders and women, who decided that it was better to fight for a national health service that was British and social insurance for unemployment and against sickness at a British level, to fight for factory legislation and decide it was wrong 
to have factories in Scotland with different conditions and different status and different requirements on employers from factories in England, but it was necessary for solidarity and to protect workers to have UK factory legislation. Were they wrong? Were they being conned by someone? Were they betraying Scottish ideals or traditions or were they not realising Scottish values and Scottish traditions? Was it right for them to argue that pensions and the health care and also, of course, social insurance and housing at that time and the end of the poor law should lead to a British welfare state or should they have created simply a Scottish welfare state? And I want to suggest to you that the three reasons that I brought forward are the reasons why they did it and they are reasons that are still relevant today. They did it because they believed that the principles of justice should apply to everyone. They did it because they believed it was better to pool and share resources, because then you could share the risk right across the whole country, and you could levy money on the basis of who can afford it across the whole of the United Kingdom. And they did it because they did not want to see conditions in Scotland undermined because there was a race to the bottom, because different parts of the United Kingdom could offer different standards and conditions in a way that would mean that there was a race, a dog-eats-dog -dog competition between the rest. Now, you might see that, say that these reasons are no longer relevant. You might want to argue that they were wrong in the first place, but the history of what happened to all the things that trade unionists are concerned about, factory legislation, health and safety legislation, mines legislation, national insurance, unemployment benefit, the health service, the building of houses, is what I say it is, that people decided for these reasons that it was better to build and share and pool resources across the United Kingdom than to have a race to the bottom, people competing with each other and trying to lower the conditions as a result. Now, they had a particular view of social justice. They didn't believe it was equality of outcome. They believed it was fairness of outcome and equality of opportunity. They believed unfair privileges for no one and equal opportunities for all. They believed in equal opportunities and fair outcomes. And that was the view of social justice. But to me, the principles that they were applying have got to be considered as still relevant. Because what happened? We created a situation which is unique in any country that I know of in the world, where there is an equality of not just political rights, but social rights and economic rights between Scotland and England. There is equal right to unemployment benefit. There is an equal right to health insurance. There is an equal right to help when you're sick and disabled. There's an equal right also that if one part of the country has an economy that is failing, the other part of the economy has a duty to help. And so much so that when the Scottish banks got into trouble in 2009, nobody said that Scotland should have to pay the bill. People said it was right that the whole of Britain had to make sure that the banking system did not destroy the finances of people in Scotland and elsewhere. So I'm talking about fundamental principles of social justice, and the issue is, how do you apply them for the modern world? Now, let's take some of the policies that have now been put forward about what we now do. And I think Campbell was very interested in the first one, because the coalition government is now proposing, is it not, that there will be regionally and nationally varied pay rates for the public sector. The argument is if private sector wages are different in one part of the country, then public sector wages should reflect that. The argument is that wages, they say, should reflect local market conditions. Now, on the face of it, that is an argument that a nationalist uh, would accept. Scottish pay bargaining, not British pay bargaining. Scottish pay rates, not British pay rates. But I think most people in Scotland realise that that is a mistake. And I think most people in Scotland realise that if you're doing exactly the same job in Scotland as in England, then you should have the right not to be discriminated against in the pay rate that you have to pay. But in October, this will be an issue because the coalition government is looking at proposals to have the regional variation in pay rates in the public sector and the national variation between Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England. And I would say to you that the principles that our trade union leaders in the past applied when they were looking at social insurance and looking at the economy as well as looking at the health service are relevant to this debate today. That if we get into 
a situation where the good part of the country is being undercut by the bad and the bad's been undercut by the worst and we have that race to the bottom, then everybody would suffer. Regional benefit rate. The Prime Minister has floated the idea that there should be separate regional benefit rates. Again, the same argument applies. If you're suffering from the same conditions in one part of the United Kingdom, is it not right also that there is an argument for the equal treatment of you in that condition? Because what I'm really saying is this. What was actually established over the last two centuries was a right of citizenship that is not simply a political right to being a citizen of the United Kingdom. It was an economic and social right as well. And what is therefore established is an equality of treatment between different citizens in a different country that is unparalleled in any other country in the world. If you look at neighboring states across the world, Mexico, America, what's the difference between average income per head? Five to one. If you look at Malaysia, Singapore, next door to each other, you'd think they would converge in the living standards because they were neighboring states. They don't. Five to one. Morocco, Spain, Huge differences in income per head in these countries. Israel, Palestine, a thousand percent. What's the difference between Scotland and England in average income per head? Four percent, not a thousand percent, four percent. And why is that? Because we have achieved these basic rights that are guaranteed to every citizen of the United Kingdom. So let's not just take public sector pay, let's take corporation tax. And of course the argument grows and it's there in Northern Ireland as well. Separate rates of corporation tax. It sounds attractive, doesn't it, that one part of the country could have a different rate of corporation tax from the other. Uh, it would mean that companies could choose which part of the country they go to, footless industry, on the basis that they're paying different rates of corporation tax, and the cheaper rate would be attractive to one set of companies who would move out of one country into another. It's what Ireland did, after all, which was hailed for a time as a great success. But you know the Irish lower corporation tax was paid for by money from the European community in money allocated to Ireland over that period. And what is actually the effect of being able to vary corporation tax rates? Well, you have less revenue in one part of the country, which is the lower corporation tax rate. You then have less public services as a result. You then have a fight between different parts of the country trying to get the footloose industry, and the whole of the United Kingdom then becomes a number of different regions a number of different parts and territories for the purpose of setting corporation tax, but then the funding of public services. So it may seem superficially attractive to set different corporation tax rates, but I would say that is against the principles of social justice that has been proposed uh, by the trade union leaders whose history of the last 200 years I'm trying to describe. Corporation tax rates, minimum, what about the minimum wage? Huge argument now. Why not do it? It's part one party's policy, I'll not mention who, who, which party, is to have regionally varied minimum wage. So you'd have a different minimum wage in one part of the country from another, and you would do that on the basis that, of course, local pay conditions, market conditions, as they say, are different in one part of the country from another. But who benefits from that? Because you would have a lower minimum wage in a poorer part of the country, a higher minimum wage in a richer part of the country, and then employers would be able to use that to exploit conditions that would allow them to go to those areas where the minimum wage was negligible or non-existent or alternatively was a lot lower than the other part of the country. And I just say to you that when you actually start to look at the practical examples of how separating off the benefit system, the wages system, then separating off the minimum wage system and having different minimum wage rates, there were good principled reasons why the trade unionists that Campbell Christie represented supported public sector pay being negotiated at a British level. There were good reasons why they supported the right to health care being paid for by tax levied at a British level. There were good principled reasons why they wanted the housing system to be paid for by exchequer contributions and not simply by local authorities. And then come to this issue of fiscal autonomy because it sounds incredibly attractive, doesn't it? Scotland decides all its own fiscal issues. England decides all its own fiscal issues. Wales then decides all its own fiscal issues. So the only revenue you can spend is the revenue you raise. So the only revenue you have, you have to uh, use for your own public spending. There is no redistribution of resources across the United Kingdom. 
Now, anybody who believes in the egalitarian principles that I believe in would find that that is the end of what I think is a principle governing the way we operate, which is that we pool and share resources. When one area is in difficulty, you help that area from the resources that are greater in the other area. If it was Scotland that was doing well, it would help the rest of the country. If it was England doing well, it would help the rest of the country. If it was Wales doing well, it would help the rest of the country. You could have Scotland's oil, you might have England's gas, you might have Wales, Welsh coal. But the principle of pooling and sharing resources is what I think is central to any Scottish view of Scottish social justice. And therefore, fiscal autonomy is the idea that no matter what the resources are in different parts of the United Kingdom, you just separate them off as territorial units and you have to raise resources in one part to pay for everything in the other part. And if one part of the country is not doing well or has greater needs or even has got greater geographical needs because it's a third like Scotland of the land of the United Kingdom and therefore has greater needs, then that doesn't matter because the principle is fiscal autonomy. So I just want people to think as we have this debate over the next two years about the future of Scotland and about the principles of social justice. I think there is a danger that the referendum debate is about process and procedure and not about principles. There's a danger we get into the insider Westminster or Hollywood mentality of talking about the minutiae of detail about how you run a referendum or what the questions are and everything else, important as they are. The more fundamental issue is what is in the people of Scotland's interest? What are the aspirations of the people of Scotland? What are the needs of the people of Scotland? How can the principles of social justice best be met in the 21st century? And there's hard truths that we in Scotland have got to face up to as well. I don't think it's right, personally, that you have a situation where we believe in the principles of social justice applied fairly to everyone, and we have tuition fees charged in Scotland to Scot uh, free in Scotland to Scottish students, free to anybody from the rest of the European Union, but we charge someone who comes from England. And I think that will become increasingly a difficulty as tuition fees in England go up. And I'm not saying there's an easy solution to it, but there should be a negotiation about it, because it seems to me not in tune with the principles that I support about social justice, that one group of people gets an unfair deal as against other people who are getting a fairer deal. And then take discrimination against women, and we can go through areas where there is discrimination on the grounds of gender, on the grounds of sex, on the grounds of race, and of course in Scotland on grounds of religion. But take this issue that has been raised this week about women. If the golf club in Augusta can start to admit women, then shouldn't St Andrews, shouldn't the Royal and Ancient Golf Club admit women to their membership? If they can do it in South Carolina, can we not do it in Scotland? And I think we've got to think hard and long about issues of discrimination in our own country, where we've got to tackle that inequality and tackle that injustice. So here is a debate that we're going to have over the, these next two years. Good trade union principles of solidarity are an issue in this debate. Social justice is what I say, if I'm right, the defining characteristic of what it is to be a Scot and thinking about Scotland's role in the world. We believe in a universal value and therefore we want to practice it, not just locally, but at every stage in which we have a part to play. There were good principled reasons why we moved in the last two centuries from just Scottish social policy to having UK legislation to protect people and to give them their rights. I was asked to speak for 45 minutes and I learned a very big lesson the first year I became a member of parliament in uh, Fife. Jack Jones, who was the head of the pensioners organization at that time, invited me on behalf of pensioners in Kakodi to go to speak to a pensioners gathering. I arrived in Kakodi, it wasn't in my constituency at the time and, and now is, I arrived in Kakodi at this great pensioners uh, meeting and I hadn't been given much details of it. I went in and I asked the chairman how long he wanted me to speak and he said 45 minutes. So there was nothing that was unsaid about the case for pensioners. The international comparisons, what had been happening under the Conservatives, everything that was uh, going wrong. And then when I finished speaking, the chairman stood up and said, I'm sorry, there's not enough time for any other speeches. And he said, I'm afraid the band, you'll have to cut your repertoire. And I'm afraid I must apologize to the audience of pensioners here because your food will now be cold. <laughs> and I said to the chairman, I thought you said you wanted me to speak for 45 minutes. 
He said, four to five minutes. <laughs> and I hope, Trisha, I haven't uh, taken an indulgence here in speaking for the time uh, that I have uh, done. Let me end with a story. John Kenneth Galbraith was probably the best-known economist in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. And he wasn't a modest man, by the way. When he was asked who were the three greatest economists in the world, he said the other two were Keynes and Adam Smith. <laughs> but he told me this great story that he was asked to speak at the 40th anniversary of the Austrian Republic in 1985. After the war, 1945, 40 years. And he said when he went along to this meeting, it was rather like speaking in the Austrian parliament, there were in the front row all the famous Austrian economists. And some of you may know from your history that these were the most right-wing economists in the world. Hayek, von Mises, Heilbronner, all these Austrian economies and the famous Austrian school of economists had been invited to this meeting. And he started off by saying, I want to thank Mr. Hayek, Mr. von Mises, and Mr. Heilbronner for what they have achieved for Austria over the last 40 years. He said, because if they had not left the country after 1945, <laughs> Austria would never have been able to enjoy such a period of prosperity <laughs> with social justice. And you know, the issue is, as Galbraith described it, what are we going to do over these next few years as we face the rest of the 21st century to achieve in practice and to realize in practice these principles of social justice? If I'm right that we want to pursue, and this is the Scottish view, these principles of social justice through creating equality of opportunity, aggressively pursuing fairness of outcome, making sure that every young child, as we believed in from the 16th and 17th century, should have the chance of a better education and the chance to realize the potential to the full. If we're going to meet the objectives that Campbell lived his life by, which was to create provision for people that, it, as his mother said, would give them rights and security so that no one should end their life like his father did, without sick pay when he was ill, without a death benefit because even when he had had an industrial disease, without an occupational pension, even although he'd worked all, these, all his life. If we're going to achieve these principles of social justice, it's, it's not easy to dismiss the history of the last 200 years. It's not easy to walk away from what we achieved by establishing economic and social rights. Now, in case anybody thinks I'm satisfied with what has been achieved, I am not. I'm po probably more determined than ever to achieve social justice in this country and beyond. And I'm determined that we broadcast the ideas of social justice, not just in this country, but across the world. But there is a serious debate to be had that we cannot ignore about how we achieve social justice. And there are really two schools of thought you achieve it better by an independent state or you achieve it by a Scottish Parliament such as we have achieved working as part of the United Kingdom. And I just say to you today, don't throw away the idea that we have managed to achieve, imperfect as it is, equal social and economic rights that no other country in the world, not the European Union, which is a single market, it is not a social market, not the United States of America, where there are massive inequalities between different parts of the uh, country that are not resolved by the legislation that I've been talking about in health and in social security and in unemployment benefit and everything else. Not resolved in any other countries I know which stand as neighbors to each other geographically, where while you might expect there to be convergence because your neighbors actually, in many cases, they are diverging even now, and the inequalities are becoming greater. So as we have this debate, just think what decisions trade union leaders had to make in the 19th and 20th century, and what decisions we have got to make in the 21st century. And I believe that many people will conclude that to achieve social justice, which is not only my inspiration, but also my hope for the future, we need to seriously consider not breaking up the economic and social rights that we have achieved and the pooling and sharing of resources that has been a feature of the last 50 years in particular. And as we conduct this debate in the future, I hope it will be not a debate about minutiae, 
and not a debate about process and procedure, but it will be a debate true to the spirit, not just of the Scottish pioneers I'm talking about, but to Campbell Christie, who died only last year, a debate that concentrates on the principles of social justice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gordon. I would now like to invite everybody in the Chamber to attend the reception hosted by Scotland's Futures Forum in the Garden Lobby, where light refreshments will be provided, and I can assure you the food hasn't yet gone cold. Uh, you're all more than welcome to attend, should you have the time to do so. If you wish to att attend, please follow the instructions of the event assistants who will guide you to the Garden Lobby, and I look forward to seeing you down there. Thank you.